Welcome to Holly History, where we discuss what you want to hear. No fake news, no alternative facts. Just history, all the time. Greetings from the Holly Central School District Library. This is Holly History, where we discuss what you want to hear. I'm joined by Mike Crispin today, Matt Hennard, and I'm Nick DeMuro. It's good to be back. It's, uh, it's been a while. We hope to record multiple episodes and keep them coming out. Last year in the springtime, I think it's kind of all of our busy seasons. and uh, We became slackers. We, we really slipped up, and we even had some people demanding today kind of like, where's the other Holly History episodes? Like, why aren't I hearing them? Um, I coach track in the spring. Uh, Matt does unified basketball. Mike has two very involved children who are always doing something. Um, so we all get kind of busy. But this is kind of, I don't want to say our downtime part of the year, but if we have time to record, I feel like late fall, early winter is our best shot. So the plan is, uh, I mean, that's when this whole show was conceived, was uh, during that time. So we we are probably planning on, sorry, Matt just came up with one of the answers to his questions. So I, had to, <laughs> I had to chuck a little bit. Sorry. Um, I think we're going to be planning on recording multiple episodes throughout the months of November and December and then releasing them monthly as they come out. So the goal is to have one, at least one per month. Um, there might be shows where it's just me or just somebody else uh, if they want to do something. For example, I'm planning on doing a show on my senior thesis on uh, French and New War, which I'm sure you all find riveting and fascinating. Um, hopefully it gets some listens, but we'll see. Doubt um, it. Yeah. Uh, okay. We're so, hoping in the future, too, to get some folks involved, get some students yeah, involved, we need to get, get some, some more faculty and need, staff involved. We need to get some... We, I already talked to uh, Mr. DeSessa about doing um, doing a whole show on organized crime. I was just going to say it, History of the Mafia. Yeah, just doing a whole show on organized crime. Uh, he said, what mafia? What are you talking about? <laughs> um, doesn't exist. So... Uh, we started a current events podcast recently um, with the current events class that I teach called Holly Hub. It's on YouTube um, for with, titled Holly Hub, and make sure you follow them on Twitter at Hub Holly. Uh, Holly Hub was already taken on Twitter, so it has to be at Hub Holly. Don't ask me; I don't understand it, but it is the way it is. Um, the Salomon Steve Holly was nice enough to come in today for ACT week. I did hear uh, that. Yeah, his he. Uh, he came in, kind of saw the kids recording, asked them some questions, and he actually agreed to come back on the show uh, later on. So that's going to be awesome to have him on Tea Time with Greg. Oh, my oh, God. That's awesome. Yeah, and I love that Tchaikovsky's Waltz of the Flowers is his <laughs> intro song. Did you preface with uh, Mr. Holly that Greg is our our uh, local local no, communist? No, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't no. talk about the Greg no. being a communist, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> Sorry, Greg. So yeah, make sure you subscribe and follow that um, on on YouTube. And as we also have a YouTube celebrity who will be joining us on our podcast, who's a member of our department, Dan Light. Oh, I've heard yeah. of him. I mean, he's got the greatest YouTube channel ever. He, the kids it. love it. He, he's a celebrity. The kids did show me his uh, zombie crossbow video the other day. It was quite interesting. <laughs> what? Zombie crossbow video? Have you seen it? That's a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> he made no, his own not. zombie crossbow. You got to check it out. Oh my god. <laughs> this isn't happening. You gotta check it out. He's right. he's I mean, he's preparing for life after teaching. He's gonna become a YouTube personality. <laughs> a YouTuber, he go, you know there's money in it. There is definitely money in it. If you, money if, in the it. guys from Dude Perfect can make money. Oh my god. Anybody gosh. can. Well, I've yep. seen a lot of others. Hey, don't forget to, to check out Holly History on Twitter as well. We're yeah, on we're on at, Twitter. At Holly History. Um, we'll be asking for some feedback today, and uh, if you want to email us your questions or feedback, which we're going to need, it is uh, hollyhistory65 at gmail.com. So please make sure that you do that as well. Um, today we have three questions for you. It's going to be a little bit shorter of an episode. Uh, we're just kind of easing back into things. So we're going to start with a question Mike Christman had for us, and he, he loves this question. This is something we talk about all the time, and it's like one we can revisit because we can expand it to a lot of different things. We've talked about doing that too. So the question is, who was the most important American who was not a president before the Civil War? That's a bit of a twister here. Uh, it boggled Henard's mind um, as we were sitting here before the show I wish I had record on. Uh, but then again, is it really hard that to, to boggle Henard's mind? Is it really that? Oh, wow. Wow. Shots fired, wow. Shots fired um, early. Okay, so who wants, to, who wants to kick off with this one? I mean, it's Mike's question. Why don't you uh, take it away? Sure, I'll go ahead and, and start. And I actually uh, floated this question to my college class uh, today, and we were talking about it. And they were saying, you know, 
after the Civil War, it's easy. Like, there's tons of people you can start looking at, non-presidential folks, who have, you know, a significant impact on American history. And I've, I've said for years, actually since, all the way back since I was teaching seventh grade, to me, Henry Clay is the, the linchpin to American history between, like, 1810 to the just before the Civil War. Um, which is interesting because where Henry Clay dies, uh, I know I know Matt's person is going to be picking up. Um, you know, Henry Clay is a war hawk. He le he helps lead the United States into war the War of eighteen twelve, kind of having an eye on Canada and the Western lands. He's the great compromiser, as we taught in seventh grade. You know, <clears throat> um, with the Missouri Compromise, Compromise eighteen fifty, um, really to me keeps the country together and is willing to give to get things the great compromiser he's the speak he's one of the to me one of the great speakers of the house um, from a western uh western part of the country when the western part of the country is the frontier and expanding and growing um but clay dies in 1852 right yeah in, in 1852 you know, you're you're on the doorstep of the civil war and i've always told the kids i don't think that they're i don't think it's a coincidence that Clay dies in 52 and really the war, the war of words really starts up soon afterwards. Yeah. The, the rhetoric, um, not necessarily bleeding the shooting Kansas, war. 1854. Right, yeah, 54 is bleeding Kansas. Um, and, and that is the real precursor in my mind to, to what's gonna happen nationally. So Clay is one of those folks that's just underestimating. You know, I always feel bad for him. The guy runs for president four times. In my estimation, he's he's just he always seems to be the wrong guy at the wrong time. You know, he yeah. he runs against Jackson. Yeah. He runs against uh, John Quincy Adams uh, in the corrupt bargain in eighteen twenty four, and Clay actually helps John Quincy Adams win that election. Um, he just he doesn't have the um, the national pull of votes to be able to win it all. But as Speaker of the House, probably one of the most influential people we've ever had go through that building. Well. I feel like with Clay, what you, what you have is the fact that Quincy Adams is has that Massachusetts base, which has been so influential post-revolution. And then even after you have, like, they're going to stick with Quincy Adams' election in that time period. And the country's so factionalized, and uh, Clay, I feel like, doesn't pull enough of the Northeast or the South. Right, and you need the you West know? then to win the election. And exactly, he's, the, he, he's, yeah, like, he's like the, the missing piece of right. this too. Well, it's, it's interesting you say the factionalizing because you know we folks today want to talk about how divided we are mm -hmm. as a nation, which to a certain degree I agree. But when then there's there's the folks who say we've never been this divided. I'm like, whoa, time out. You know, go all the way back, ant Federalists, anti Federalists, North. We've always South. had partisanship, and, and to say that. And say we have is almost ignoring things. I mean, right. Burr and Hamilton shot at each other. Right. People yeah. Just you know, when has this country not operated off partisanship and differences? And I think the difference is in the past, the pe people's political careers weren't careers. It was more of a right. servant job. Right. And so they were able to do things for the greater good instead of keeping themselves employed. And that to, me that, is, makes that to me is Clay's, that is Agreed. his Absolutely. essence, yeah. is it's about the greater good for everybody. It's not about the North or the South or the West gaining advantage. It's how can we get through this mm -hmm. to, and keep the union intact? And then the union falls apart. So when we say, do you think politicians became, I want to keep myself in a career over a greater good? At what point do we reach that point in American history? Oh, wow. I think it's a fairly recent trend, personally. I think you're right. And the, I feel like the perks and the salaries don't really... Look at our early presidents. People are dying with, like, Matt, Thomas Jefferson has massive amounts of debt. Right. You know what I mean? And, and, and that's... Being president is a, is a pay cut for those guys. Well, we were talking about you know? that in my class today. We were talking about the Constitution and the fact that most representatives and senators are actually taking a pay cut. Right. Because it, it's more about their legacy than it is about mm -hmm. the money. But then they get the money through lobbyists and you know speaking fees and things like that. I do. I agree with you. I think that is a more modern thing. I don't know if you can really nail it down. Um, for presidents, I, th I think it's a post Civil War thing. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, and, and Lincoln's you know the consolidator of power and things like that. But uh, I don't know. I, I agree with you. It's definitely a modern thing. Yeah, I don't know if you can put it. Th that might be a whole podcast show right. in itself. I don't think we can really get into that. Um, 
So leaving with 1852 and Henry Clay dying, I'm going to turn over to Matt because I know his picks up right yeah. from there. I'll, I'll, I'll how I, that we never planned that either, so that was kind of... Right, yeah, it was actually kind of random because I was actually struggling. Uh, being that I do focus a lot of my study and stuff on global, um, a lot of times my really detailed American history is pretty much limited. Um, I know that, you know, the story of... of the U.S. coming coming to be, and you know the major events from then on. But the real uh, nuances of American history, I usually get left out. But um, I was thinking about a lot of different people: uh, James Madison, right? Um, Thomas Jefferson, <coughs> George Washington, right? All of these people who played such a huge role before the U.S. Because uh, really, the Revolutionary Period is probably my favorite period in history. I love the Enlightenment. Uh, I love. Uh, revolutionary ideas, all that kind of stuff. So I was trying to think about guys so well with global. along those lines. Right, right. So, but every single one of them goes on to become president. Mm -hmm. So it pretty much uh, eliminated all of that. So I started thinking, um, and I came up with Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, which is Good why choice. Mike was saying that uh, you know kind of picks up where he left off. So Henry Clay dies in 1852, and Harriet Beecher Stowe publishes her famous work, Uncle Tom's Cabin, in 1852. Um, and basically, uh, my argument for why, when you think about the Civil War, right, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin has a major pivotal role in at least starting to bring more Northerners to the side of the abolition, and the abolition cause, right? Um, in her story detailing the horrors and, and terror, right, of plantation slavery. Um, I think that a lot of times there was a misconception uh, from the Northerners about how, or maybe not even a misconception, just really an ignorance, right? Like a complete mm -hmm. lack of what the slave system was all about. The idea of families being split up, children being ripped from their mothers, right? Uh, all of those terrible, terrible things that maybe were, were lost in the discussions on slavery when you talk about North versus South. Um, and really the, uh, the explosion of Uncle Tom's Cabin and the amount of people who read it. The crazy thing when I was looking, it's the second best selling book of the 19th century Behind the other Bible. than the Bible, yeah. right? Other than the Bible. So it's bigger than the Communist Manifesto? <laughs> There you go, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. I yeah, like that. I like that. that. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the idea that it, it just that alone in itself could be argued that it's yeah. seriously in influential before the Civil War. right? But taking that idea and uh, getting those Northerners on board with being anti slavery, right, and then furthering that divide that you were both just talking about. Um, well, when I'll Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe. Oh, that's right. right? So, what is it? This is the, the little, little lady, lady that started, started this all this war. Or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, crazy. I think it's interesting. In my college class, we look at 12 Years a Slave. We read some excerpts and watch some, some of the video clips, uh, which really intense you know, scenes. And I think it's so interesting that Harriet Beecher Stowe book is, is more popular, even though it's technically a work of fiction, whereas in Solomon Northrop's book is... His, uh, it's his autobiography, yeah. and it's published in 1853, which is the next year. But I just, it, I, I'm, I'm why it doesn't get the same. Why it doesn't get of, the same play? Yeah. You know, and, and I also think it's interesting too because here you have a, a woman, yeah, in a historical time period where women are not um, valued as much as writers, mm -hmm. you know, and, okay, and, right. and gets that play. I could probably throw this out there in the fact of um, why. Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin gets more attention is because I think 12 Years a Slave is so heavy and dense. Um, that's part of it. But also Harry Beecher Stowe's is technically a work of fiction with right. history in it, mm -hmm. which is we, we talk about in a previous podcast episode of, of I think people are gravitated towards stories instead right. of hard history. And I think that's what Harriet Beecher Stowe does for you in her work, which is so powerful. is It's, it's a story, but you're getting real things from that story. And that's because it technically is a work of fiction, right? Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Like historical fiction, even today, I bet is probably more oh, popular yeah. and well read than well, like some. Kind I of think the books you're going to get now, and there's a big movement of this, is the stuff like that. Uh, Candace Millard writes. She wrote Hero of the Empire. She wrote um, The River of Doubt. Theodore Roosevelt. These mm -hmm. books are immensely popular because it's, it's it's hard history. It's real history, but she's telling a story. You can't put those books down. So the Eric Larson books. Eric Larson's blowing up. These, I think, that's the future of history that people are 
interested right. in. I mean, even even we catch ourselves like I I'm reading um, right now. I'm reading a book on uh, called White Savage about Sir William Johnson. I can't read much more than twenty pages at a night. Right. At a certain point, I want to put that book down. I'm like, um, I need a break. It's you gotta spend right. twenty pages on you know the, the trade goods around his house. Like, come on, like you gotta take a break from that for a certain point. And just uh, twenty pages put it, is impressive. Huh? Put it down. Yeah, About 10. Well, good history is good storytelling. It is. I, I've yeah. always said that. Um, you know, you, you have some of these journalists now, like um, you know, um, Kilmeade, uh, Brian Kilmeade. Yep. And um, and they're seeking out historians. And, 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 and uh, Bill O'Reilly. Yeah. You know, and say what you want about their politics or whatnot, but they they tell a good story. Washington yeah. Secret Six. That's a great a book. Quick and easy read, and you get a lot of good stuff out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, O'Reilly has that series of books, you know, killing, killing, killing everything, killing Patton, killing Lincoln, killing Jesus, killing the Rising Sun. Really good reads that kids can kind of wrap their brains around. And it's giving them good history, but it's not that dense academic stuff that you can only yep. read ten pages yep. a night and your brain's fried. You know? And there's a right. place for that dense academic stuff. I mean, that that history now is so good because you have to prove everything. Mm-hmm. It's not like in the early 19th century where you know somebody's writing about the fall of the Roman Empire. Oh, they became too decadent. They, you know, can you really prove that? I'm gonna I'm, gonna, gonna, take, I mean? I'm like, gonna take a shot across the bow in another department here. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a shot across the bow at the English department. because Are you sure you want to do that? Absolutely. Because okay. I've, I've been arguing with the kids that the English department's folks have been stealing. Yeah. And, and not just our department, but the English folks in state ed stole from historians. This yeah. idea of claim evidence. Mm-hmm. This is what historians have done for centuries. If you're going to make a claim that Rome was the greatest em- empire ever, right? It certainly was. Or the, Mon- or the Mongolian Empire, not the greatest close. empire ever, right? Ooh. You got to lay out the evidence. Can debate. <laughs> Maybe that's a good question for a podcast, right? Um, but you got to lay out the evidence to back that up. Right. That's historical, right? But historians, the English always, are borrowing from Historians us, didn't right? always do that, though. As far as like more can, modern can, can historians, you, can you really e- evaluate the decadence of the Roman Empire? That's something right. I can really equate. But I, that's why I'm saying you know, is, that's what I'm trying to connect right, back to. Yeah. I guess is good historical writing, what better historical writing, which yes, I think which is more in modern. the last 40, yeah, 50 40 years, years right. has really turned to that claim evidence. Right? If you're going to claim it's a decadent empire, then you better sure as heck be able yeah. to back that up and show how it leads to the fall. It is my favorite thing about social studies. I mean, you can. Pretty much always be right because you just want to argue your point. Right. That's your favorite yeah, thing. I just say right? that is my favorite <laughs> exactly. Thing. I tell the kids that all the time. It's a great hook, right? Yeah. Hey, you want to be right all the time? Become a historian, right? right. And pick wisely. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> you better be sure. <laughs> pick your battles <laughs> wisely. Right, right, right. right. Um, well, I, my choice was Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and, you know, I'm a big Anglophile. fan. He's an Anglophile, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, thank goodness that Lin Manuel Miranda wrote the musical he did about this guy, because I mean, now everybody still has the trendy pick, like. Tomorrow mm-hmm. took the trendy pick. Um, it didn't used to be the trendy pick until that musical. Like that mm-hmm. really redeemed him a lot. I mean, Ron Chanel's book Hamilton is a wonderful read. It is. It, dense, it's though. dense, oh but goodness. I mean, there's another book you can't. You you read ten pages. Okay, put it to the wayside. I'm go, I'm done for a while. Uh, but Hamilton, as far as I mean, he's Washington's aide de camp. Uh, leads a very excellent. You know, he fought before that. Washington's aide de camp really is the jelly that holds that crew together through some hard times. Um, Almost like a sunlight figure to Washington, uh, he, at Yorktown he leads a very you know famous charge, Battle of the Seals Revolution. He writes the Federalist Papers, along with Jay and it's Madison, right. and and the fact that he writes fifty something and the other ones write like combined like what like twenty something thirty, right. um, really getting the constitution, people getting on board with the Constitution, and being an influential delegate at that too, um, probably stepping outside his comfort zone, being one of the youngest representatives there. Uh, literally always thinking he is the smartest person in the room probably at all times, which gets in a little bit of trouble. Which is why you like him so much. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And his work as Secretary of the Treasury. Um, We can go on for all day about this. The Assumption Plan to assume the state's debts, build credit with foreign nations, um, helping to establish stock exchange, the idea and principles behind that, uh, which finance, he sees like, the future of financing uh, being allowing America to grow. I didn't know this. There was a 15-foot statue of him in the New York Stock Exchange that they had built of him put there, but it went and burned in the fire of 1835. Really? Yeah, but they had wow. a 15-foot statue of him. Right. I mean, let's and let's face it. If you look at America in the World Wars and you look at us as a global power, really, why are we able to do that? It's because we just can bankroll anything at any time. Which I think 
is a reflection of Hamilton's system that he built. And, and if, if the business of America's business, as Calvin Coolidge said, I think Hamilton's the guy who starts that. Um, then his anti-slavery work, you know, he really gets the ball rolling on some of that. He has a society he founds in New York. His foreign policy of neutrality, advising Washington. Uh, he formed the Coast Guard. You know, that's kind of a little extra. I think you found the New York Post too, didn't you? Uh, one of the papers. I, don't I think I think it was the New York Post. I'm not positive on that, but I'm pretty sure it was the New York Post. Um, and then I kind of came up with a list of like, you know, I made my case for Hamilton, but I was just writing names down. I guess like it's one one A's. I mean, I, I put Benedict Arnold in there because of course you, you don't win the war without Arnold. Um, Frederick Douglass. I don't think you're going to find a more influential African American before the Civil War, and you could argue after too. I mean, local he, times too, or local connections. Local connections in Rochester too. Cool. I mean, the guy. I just got done reading his narrative for the second time. It, it, wonderful book. Um, ben Franklin's got to be in the conversation probably somewhere, mm -hmm. some for something. How about John C. Marshall? Or is it John, John Marshall? Did I add the C? Am I getting confused with Calhoun? Yeah, I think I'm confused with Calhoun. But Marshall, yeah. the Marshall Court. Marshall Court. That's one that certainly set precedent the, enough to. Yeah. And actually, my college class we were talking about it today. You know, expanding that power of the judicial branch to become equal. Yep. To the other two branches. Uh -huh. Yep. Constitutionally. Yep. I could see that. Yeah. Marquis de Lafayette. I mean, he's kind of towards the bottom, probably though. Uh, and can you consider? I mean, he's an American, certainly. Yeah, right. I think towards the bottom because of his French roots. No, I didn't say anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> Nathaniel Green, another revolutionary general, very influential. How about uh, Thomas Paine? Thomas Paine. T. Paine. Yeah, T. Paine. T. Paine. <laughs> T. Paine. He's up there. That, that reference writer of common sense. I it's know. Lost it its has luster it has, in, the, in the more recent days. When I first started teaching, the T. Paine reference always <laughs> got the kids when we talked about Thomas. Paine. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Abigail Adams. Some of her writings. I mean, she she. Without her, does John Adams even get a second look in the history books? You know what I mean? Does does that happen? And a lot of people think that, you know, is he is he a tyrant instead of this yeah. founding father? Yeah, yep. I think that's a good one too. Uh, hmm. John, how about John Brown? Influential. I well, yeah. you know, um, was it Douglas called him the meteor of the war? I mean, he's the precursor to everything. Yeah, he is. You know, um, you know, and Douglas said, you know. I, I can I can argue for the slave. John Brown can die for the slave. Right. Yep. Holy smokes! You know, it doesn't get more you don't get more committed to the cause. Right. Than that. It, it's just it's well, interesting. high praise coming from Douglas. Douglas well. too. Well, and all and albeit with John Brown is far from perfect. Oh, true. Um, yeah. I true mean, he, yeah. we had my you know I, I got to credit my uh, college professor uh, Professor Barron at Geneseo. You know, is, is there such thing as a good terrorist? You know what I mean? Is is this that his cause? One man's I mean, freedom fighter is another man's well, terrorist. Well, uh, how about Nat Turner? Right. I mean, Nat, Nat Turner is... He, well, he claimed he had a vision from God. Yes. And Very know, similar to John Brown. Right. Like both John Brown, I read an interesting book uh, a couple summers ago that claimed that it was more of a psychological profile of John Brown. They thought he was uh, potentially bipolar. Yeah. That I mean, he meets all the classic... He has these manic episodes, right? That he's just completely... He can't yeah. be reasoned with whatsoever. And some of the things he does is just... Dumb. Like militarily, you oh, just yeah, go, yeah. What, what what were you doing? I mean, Nat Turner talking about strangling a child in, in a crib. Mm -hmm. They actually don't. They leave. I believe in the right. They leave the plantation. They come back. Yeah. Um, you know. So I mean, I'm not. These are figures that are up for debate. I think all these figures are up for Absolutely. debate in their own way. Uh, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stan could be in there. Lucretia Mott. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could. We could sit here all day. Uh, but moving on to the next question, we have. Horse. I mean, horse man, right? Horse founder, yeah, founder of right. public education. Yeah, we had a former student who said if uh, he could go back in time and take out any one person, it would be Horace Mann. Because <laughs> he didn't want to. Because he didn't want to go to school. Nice. <laughs> nice. That escalated quickly. Um, <laughs> you should have asked him wow, how much work he was willing to do on your on your uh, manner then when you put him back to manorialism. Right? There you go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no <education. laughs> All right. Does George Washington? Uh, the next question we're gonna have. I watched an. Amazon special. Uh, I don't think it's an Amazon special. The, the Gingriches actually did it, which also makes it very interesting. Um, Newt Gingrich and his wife are they're the ones doing. They narrate part of the special and they're in it. And there's just like some like goofy looking scenes. I'm not gonna lie. It's some goofy narration in the special. It's not a bad special. Does Newt narrate it? Newt narrates part of it, and oh like it has my. different historians. And and I got home from the football game last Friday, and I flick it on, and uh, you know I'm watching it with my wife, and she's like, "This is kind of cheesy." And that, that's kind of me want to talk about this. Um, there's there's great parts of the of the show to be sure. 
Um, and there's great things they point out about Washington. But what I want to ask is, does George Washington deserve his almost deity-like status in American history? Special, by the way, is called the first American. Uh, does George Washington deserve his almost deity-like status in American history? What do you What do you guys think? I mean, I guess I'll lead. I don't know. I use George Washington. Um, we just finished talking about the French Revolution in my global class, mm -hmm. and we talk about to what extent was the French Revolution successful. Um, and it's difficult to argue, you know, because. Or it's not. It's easy to argue because I, I think you can make a point on both sides. But at first glance, it seems like no, the revolution wasn't successful um, because you start with a monarch and you end with a monarch. But we talk about all the things that change in between, and really that kind of discussion come, came out of Napoleon, right? Napoleon becomes an emperor, he tries to take over Europe, all that stuff, and we talk about how it's still revolutionary, and we say that a lot of times during revolutions dictators come to power. It's almost exclusively every place else in the world, right, there's these major revolutions and some form of dictator comes to power or establishes some, some kind of hereditary succession after a revolution, right? Mm -hmm. Except in the U.S. Yeah. And I mean, I, I believe that some people, you could argue that the Constitution prevents it, right, and that eventually, you know, things would have been different, but when I pose the question to the kids, if George Washington just continued to run for office, when Never does leaves. he lose? Yeah. When does he lose? Because of his rock star status, right? When does he lose? So I'll bring back to the original question, does he deserve his, his deity status? I would say yes, simply because he sets the power down and walks away. Well, he's the American Cincinnatus. Right. How many, he is the American Cincinnatus, right? And that was going to be my old white thunder. I know that, I was in, <laughs> that was where I was going to. But I should have known. I should have said Cincinnatus first because <laughs> right. the Roman is Roman. Roman. Yeah, yeah, just yeah, bring yeah. him up. But yes, the idea of setting down power, returning to your farm, right, and going back to what you're about, and that goes back to your conversation earlier about. It wasn't a career, right? He wasn't there to make a career. He didn't want to be a career politician. He didn't want to be a ruler. He didn't want to be a king. He wanted to help guide the country. And now, obviously, historically speaking, you can discuss whether or not, I know you being a Benedict Arnold fan, that mm -hmm. you, you may think that, that Washington wasn't as humble as he's made well, out I to be. I was just going to ask that question. It, the, we, we see Wash as a humble figure, and, and is the humility real? Mike's shaking his head. It can't be. If you're as good of a leader that he is, I mean, there, there's an instance, and I'm trying to remember which battle specifically it is. It's in the, it's in the New York City area, and there's a series of battles. Kips Bay? Where he goes out and he actually is using the, the flat edge of his sword to smack his soldiers to get them yeah. back into the battle. Yeah. And he's and there's another uh, time in New Jersey at uh, Monmouth where he's... He's he's in front of his soldiers and his yeah. has his back to the enemy and is screaming. Shot at them. through a few times. Yeah, it, it, he then his jacket, yeah his jacket, jacket shot through a few times. And he's screaming at them to get in line, you know, trying to trying to get them back. So I don't think I don't think he's this mild, meek, humble person. Mm -hmm. I think he's a passionate person. Um, He's re maybe a little reserved is, is what it in, in at times at times but at other times he has this fiery disposition yeah. that shows itself well I think it's I think truly he, American I think as well yes you know I think he's the opposite of an Arnold in that way or like a John mm -hmm. Adams where like fiery all the time I think George Washington's very even keel most of the time and then when because when those moments come out I think everybody around you goes Ooh. well and isn't and, that and part of being Part of leader. humility, though, in, in, no, in leadership. I, humility in leadership. Yeah. You know when to step up and you know when to kind of well, step back. And that's the other thing, too. He knew what he didn't know. Right. That, that's one thing about him. And, and, and I guess it begs the question, is it true humility? I'm kind of in the middle on this. I think there's times that I don't think his humility is an act, but I think he knows how things look and he knows how to act. He's not like a Hamilton or these fiery people around him where – uh, everybody's got to know I'm the smartest guy. Like, for example, when the, the Conway Cabal happens, right? And uh, there's these generals trying to oust him. Or, you know, there's, there's Gates, there's, there's Conway, uh, Charles Lee. All these people are trying to, you know, make him look bad and get new leadership. He ignores it. And, like, that's kind of the thing I'm talking about is he knows what's beneath him and what's... He's the opposite of, like, certain leaders we have today. 
who have to, every time somebody says something about them, they have to go tweet about it or do something about it. Washington realized what's beneath him and what not to associate with. Right. And he also knew what he didn't know in the way of, like, he, he knew what he was good at and what he wasn't good at. He's good at bringing a lot of the best people together and mediating at the convention, his cabinet, military-wise. He's not a great tactician. No. He makes a lot of mistakes, and he, he brings in people that know what they're doing. You know, like Nathaniel Green. Nathaniel Green is a brilliant tactician, so you use that guy appropriately. Um, Mike, go ahead. He, he tends to, to know this, the moment and mm-hmm. how, yeah, absolutely. like on the battlefield, using the flat of his sword. But then you also have the Newburgh conspiracy, mm-hmm. right, where he appears before the leaders who are, are willing to basically um, do a coup d'etat against the government because they're not paying the military. And he, he pulls out his glasses and makes a comment yeah. about, you know, pardon me for I have to use my spectacles. And it just, it hits home with, they holy cried cow. Yeah, the, yeah, holy my, cow, my this, eyes this guy, grown, or lost my vision. He's the, given everything, country, including yeah. his vision and, and other things. And that's not the same guy who's riding across the battlefield screaming mm-hmm. and yelling yeah. at his right, neck. Right, right. Um, so it, it, it's interesting that the, the way that question is worded. So, you know, that deity like, no. He's a man. He's a man. Right, right. He makes a lot of mistakes, yeah. Who's making decisions that he realizes, especially as president. And, and that whole Cincinnati thing is interesting because a lot of Americans don't understand. It's he wins the war. He wins the war for the Americans. Steps down. Mm-hmm. Is asked to come back by the people to, to this constitutional convention. Is elected as the president by everybody. When they're constructing the constitution, they know who they're looking at for the first president. No doubt who it's going to be. The question now isn't that they don't trust Washington. It's who, who's next. We, we trust Washington when these powers are giving him. It's who's after that. Right. But then to after after eight years, have the ability to say, I'm done. I, I can't do this anymore physically, mentally, emotionally, I think even spiritually. Um, and to also recognize the fact that future presidents are going to be looking. Yeah. And that that alone to me is what makes him such an interesting person to study because he recognizes the moment, like, yeah. you know, like Nick talked about, where... When I make decisions and important decisions, future presidents are going to look back and say, "What did Washington do?" Boston. Right, and that that is pressure. I don't think any well, he has that table wants. Right, he he knew the moment, but he also had the foresight to understand. Obviously, you couldn't, you can't foresee the twenty first century and technology, but okay. he could understand the the pressures and challenges of the job, which is why I mean, Washington's farewell address is. Timeless, One right? Of most beautifully the, written, things. right? And the you idea could, yeah. he knew the problems that would cause issues, and <laughs> we just don't we ignore him. He had, one job. He had, one, he had job. one job, right? He, nope. <laughs> he teaches the nation to move on by stepping down. He yeah. almost looks at the nation. It's almost like a, it's like a breakup. It's yeah. like, you don't need me. You really don't need me. You've st- the nation is not me. The leader, the nation is the foundations we've set up, right. and you're going to be fine without me because we've and we've gotten so far away from that. Mm-hmm. You know, now it's we elect people instead of putting faith in the institutions that have been established. Right. Um, maybe that's going a little political, but you know, I, I do think Washington, to a degree, deserves his status. But you know, this is a guy that also owned people. He was a slave owner, and that brings in the modern. You know, but do we judge him with modernized? Do we judge him in the time? Now he also did. For what it's, I mean, he was on his deathbed, had two wills brought to him. He looked at both of them and ripped up one. And we never know what that will will say, but the will that wasn't ripped up set his slaves free. Um, I think it's, if you read a lot about the guy throughout his life, he begins to see the evils of slavery, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, He doesn't know what to do about it. And he's, you know, as a historian, it's a totally legitimate case. You can argue he should do more about it. Um, there are people that argue that Washington is involved in the revolution to maintain his status or to move up in status. Because he can't, he can only go so far. With the revolution, he can go farther, and then he could establish a country that would, you know, uh, allow for people like him to rule. And mm-hmm. there's some truth to that narrative. I think I don't. I don't. Not saying I agree with it. You know, really, but that's I don't think, a that, narrative I don't think that, that's the driving force. No, I don't think but it is either. It is an underlying. It's factor. an underlying factor, and, and I think that narrative deserves. There's a great book. Uh, the, the author escapes from it called Forced Founders where it talks about uh, this Virginia class sees themselves of gentry class losing power and they are getting involved in revolution with states like Massachusetts. Oh, yeah, we're because talking about that. It's a great, year. I cannot remember the author off the top of my head right now. I read it in college, but um, I think it's a narrative that deserves to at least be discussed. Uh, 
but I, I tend to lean more towards the American Revolution being very ideological. And, uh, you know, and, and after revolutions, you, we, this kind of goes to your point, but the French Revolution is for that time period after, very ideological nation, mm-hmm. very stick to it. And then the, the reality of governing begins to set in, which then usually reverts back to a dictatorship. Mm-hmm. Um, and if Washington doesn't step down, does it happen in the U.S.? You know, it's like it's like communism. It's the same way. Very ideological Lenin era, right? right? By the time you're a Khrushchev, I'm not really willing to die for the ideal of communism through nuclear war. You can you make know. the argument, though, that there was a dictatorship after Washington. You can. Adam's presidency is very dictatorial. Yeah. Alien Sedition Acts, it, it, it's a correction, and then there's a correction back the other direction when Jefferson gets Jefferson, elected. Right. You know, so there, there's a, a there's a power struggle going on after Washington's presence. But the institution, the institution, the institution in that case does its job. And, and what's interesting is that's why I've always says what makes the American Revolution different than the French. The Americans are able to find a way to compromise, right. which is not easy to do. Mm-hmm. The French, it just seems like you know, you're in the way, you're out of the way. Well, I mean, Robespierre, for as much as he was supposed to be a man of virtue when it came in, his virtue became my virtue is the only virtue, right? And exactly. Then he begins eliminating enemies instead of compromising with them. Mm-hmm. Right. Makes total sense. <laughs> So we can close the book on Washington, I think? I think so. It's a good segue, actually, I think, into the last question. It is, it is. Uh, Last one is, uh, what was the most influential historical work you ever read and why? This is is, uh, something that just came to me last period because of some, you know, I was looking at my bookshelf, and it made me think, you know, what was the most influential thing you read that, I don't know, made you fall in love with it, made made you fall in love with the history, made you change your opinion on it? Um, Anybody want to kick this off? Go ahead. I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, so I'm going to go with two. Yeah, of course, because that's I who I am. Okay. Um, well, the first one was was a long while back. I read uh, Gordon Wood's Radicalism in the American Revolution. And uh, he talked about the liberal ideas of the revolution. Not in the, cl- not in the modern sense of liberal and conservative, but in the classical sense of this is challenging the power structure unlike any other revolution before. Challenging divine right of kings, challenging the belief that you know people are in charge of the government and you have the right to alter or abolish that's just radically radically different and is earth shattering to because well, they're not new ideas necessarily but it's like the way they're articulated the way that they're, they're going to implement them. right that's what's the way that they're going the way that they're going to yeah the way that they're going to be used mm-hmm. to justify the revolution it's not a mob mentality as, mm-hmm. as John Adams would have put it it's this is really logically thought out um, I, it really kind of framed for me the revolution in a bit of a different way. And I, I always been taught younger, you know, it's, it's farmers, you know, farmers versus you know the mighty British Empire. And yeah, I can see that from the average point of view. But when you look at the ideological mm-hmm. uh, arguments being made, they have legitimate points. And the great question always comes up in my class is kids will say to me, well, "What if Parliament would have just given them a uh, representative?" You know what would they, what would they have done? And I don't think they would have been able to do much because right. that, that simple solution to me shuts up an awful lot of right, your right. your argument. Well, and 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 they were proud to be. They thought they were partners in empire with right. the British. Right. I mean, they one of the big shockers is that oh my god, they don't see us as partners they in don't empire. See us as I don't. Part of it. Right. And if you give them that partners in empire, right. I think the first of all, the whole South is not leaving. No, no. Right, Massachusetts right, right. maybe raises some stink, but I think. Right. They're easily pacified if they get well, that. Well, and in terms of, of enlightenment anyways, I mean, Britain is well ahead of the curve, right? I mean, the Magna Carta yeah. is, oh, yeah. is in, in the 1200s, yeah. right, yeah. right. So, and I mean, they had the glorious revolution, right? Like the idea of being able to change a ruler without bloodshed, I mean, that doesn't happen anywhere outside of Britain at the time. Uh, right. So I know, yeah, 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 I, I know I'm going <laughs> to pad your Anglophilia right now for a second, but uh, the, the idea that... They they could have been still attached to obviously the the power of the British Empire, but also politically speaking, a lot of those ideas have already been challenged by the mm-hmm. British successfully. Yeah, right. right. The English Bill of Rights comes right. out of the, the Glorious Revolution, so those kinds of things are already there, and they're leaps and bounds ahead of the rest of Europe that's still stuck in you know right. absolute monarchy. Right. Second book I would say, and this one was more modern. This is after I started teaching probably about 2005-ish, was a book by Philip Morgan uh, called Slave Counterpoint. Mm. Really challenged my view of what slavery was and the power structure. 
um, the idea that slaves ran away a lot, mm-hmm. but didn't go far. They'll go to the next plantation to visit family. They'll go and they'll steal pigs for food and um, just all sorts of things that you you normally thought, oh, okay, well, slaves are um, powerless, right? They're they're totally they don't have any agency whatsoever. And and his point was they have they have limited agency within what they're doing and are able to challenge things. And they will challenge overseers occasionally when the, when the overseer is yeah. over the top and is yeah. unrealistic in his expectations. And that you know, you're not killing slaves as a, as a punishment. It's too economic, that's economically not viable to do. Right, right. So slaves use that to their advantage. And that to me was just, that was eye-opening. That yeah. was well, That's clear in fact that was the narrative he talks about right. a lot. Yeah, that is yeah. interesting. So, and I also got a chance to, I got to meet both of those authors, actually, Gordon Wood and, um, and Philip Morgan. And that was, that was really cool to, to be able to talk to them, ask them questions. You know, for history geeks like us, that, that's, the rock, that's the rock star rock world. Star, right, you know? right. So, um, yeah, that's, that's where I stand with those two. Yeah. All right. Um, mine is more of, I guess, for a, a change in my perspective. Um, I read... Uh, Flags of Our Fathers by James Bradley. Um, also, kind of, I guess, I would say he is one of those storyteller yeah, styles. Oh, yeah. It was it was much more storyteller than it was heavy. Even though there was a lot of heavy info in there, mm-hmm. uh, very good. Also, wrote what Flyboy's letters uh, to Iwo Jima, right? Yeah. Um, but the idea of Flags of Our Fathers and why it was so influential for me was uh, it was the first time that I had ever really read or learned about. Uh, the Japanese essential genocide of the Chinese during World War II and the and the years leading up to it, and it struck me because, from my educational experience, all I'd ever known about from World War II when you think genocide was the Holocaust, obviously, um, and it made me kind of it opened my eyes a little bit to the idea of kind of European centric history. And the idea that most of the history that I had known and that I had been taught in school was very European centric. Um, and I guess it kind of changed my perspective. I had always wanted to be a U.S. teacher up until that point. U.S. history was what I loved. I, you know, really, really all about U.S. history. And reading that kind of changed my perspective and gave me a desire to read a lot more about other cultures, um, getting into reading about, you know, Islam, and honestly, I read uh, the, that Kamikaze Diaries about mm-hmm. the, the Japanese Kamikaze pilots during World War II, um, things like that just really opening my mind and, and my ideas to, well, there, and that's kind of where I learned that history is kind of told differently depending on who's telling the story, and so that really opened my eyes to the fact that I had always thought that history was very cut and dry mm-hmm. and then I read that and I was like why have I never heard this before well, and yeah. so it just what really started the kids passion now? for what do we teach the kids now point of view right, right. Point of view point of view it, right. it drives me nuts that people like you, okay you'd be getting your hair cut or you're you know so it asks you something you don't know asks you what do you do I teach social studies history oh I, I never was good at that it's facts and dates facts and dates and I go that's a shame because yeah. that's not what this is about um, did you want to add to that hey, no no that's okay. good um I have a couple works, but uh, the first one is James Kirby Martin's um, Benedict Arnold Revolutionary Hero. It, it came out in the mid-90s. Uh, my grandmother bought it for me, and she really got me involved with uh, history and just a love of it. And it was way above my reading level, so I had like, come back and read it a few times as I got older. But it made me fall in love with the fact that, kind of like you said, Matt, that, that history could be different and that here's this guy that the, only the first somewhat positive biography is written 100 years after he's dead. Um, and now another one just came out, another book. Uh, Stephen Brumwell wrote a book on uh, Benedict Arnold, The American Crisis of Liberty. That's the most recent workout. That is probably the best work done on him, in my opinion. But James Kirby Martin just wrote this wonderful book um, on Benedict Arnold and sort of how, you know, how important the revolution he was. Uh, the next one I have to say is, I read this one recently as I've kind of fallen in World War One. is Now It Can Be Told by Philip Gibbs. Um, Philip Gibbs was a reporter in, during World War One, and he could not report a lot of things that were happening due to censorship from the British government. Um, something not so great about the Anglo file in me. Um, but he came out with this book after the war in the 1920s about the, all the things he couldn't write about. And, and the things you read in that book, the heroism, um, the hardships of World War One, 
World War One is so overshadowed by World War Two, and it's a shame because and that there's an American centric thing right there in our educational system. In Europe, World War One is the thing. Um, we're in the currently the hundredth anniversary of the armistice coming up here, and the end of World War One. Maybe we could do a special episode on that at some point, but. Um, the terror and the ushering in the first world war in my opinion as many other people have this opinion is the most important event of the 20th century um for a variety of reasons and now it can be told gives you the perspective of the people on the ground it is the stories that don't get told it little things um the one story that i will always go back to is there's this place in belgium and the soldiers called it hooch um in this it's it's in flanders fields and the most shocking thing to me is that they're they're digging a trench and they're filling sandbags and they're talking about uh, they're finding body parts. Um, one of the crazy things about the First World War is you live with the dead from 1914 to 1918. So there's bodies there from each year of the war. It's a static front; it doesn't move. Um, so you're living with that every day. And they're talking about you know, oh, bit of Bill, um, bit of this guy. And they're laughing about it because that's the only way they can cope with it. And that story just as I'm reading the book just stuck with me. Um, if you, if you if you just heard that sound, that was all the kids who took World Wars class last year shuddering yeah. at, at the at the sound of now it can be told because yeah we, we read a lot we of used a lot of that last year in the World Wars yeah. class and so so if some of the kids are going wait I know that story that's absolutely yeah. right and they and a lot of kids have asked to borrow that book and it has all my notes in it still from when I'm reading it <laughs> um, it's just fascinating kind of like just two minor ones Joseph J Ellis's Founding Brothers is a great book. Second generation to... after the after the revolution yep. is over, who so... takes over after Washington's mm-hmm. crew, and you know what do they do with the revolution? Is, yep. it, you, is it really yours to hang on to? It was yeah, it, great brilliant point. work. And then the last one is there's two here: Crucible of War by Fred Anderson and The War That Made America by Fred Anderson. I love the French Indian War, and, and his work with Native Americans is my favorite um, because we have a very false narrative that like they're passive. Members of the, this big event, they're another group with agency. Yeah, in yeah. reality, they're a whole separate nation with agency in that conflict. They're manipulating the Europeans. Oh my gosh. Just as much as the Europeans are manipulating. They them. play them like a fiddle. Yeah, um, very similar to the narrative of the Middle East, right? Talking about yes, yeah. yeah, very similar to the narrative of the Middle East during World War One, where are they passive victims or are they, you know, they're they're just a, they're actually agents in this whole thing, mm-hmm. um, which is very fascinating. So, kind of all good material for you to pick up if you get a chance. Um, that brings us to the end of our show for the day. So I got an assignment for folks yeah. that are out there, um, and this is a, this is something we did in my college class last year. Um, so we're we're looking for folks to give us feedback. So again, um, hollyhistory65 at gmail dot com. Uh, you can send us responses on uh, Twitter at hollyhistory. Um, so we have Mount Rushmore right out in the Dakotas that have four the four great presidents, right, according to the time when they were Theodore made. Roosevelt is on there. So. Of course, mm-hmm. right? If you had to make your own Mount Rushmore of four important people, um, and let's go with global history. Let's change it up a little bit, right? Uh, four important people from global history to make your own Mount Rushmore of global. Who would that be? And well, we can use that to kind of uh, maybe frame another question for the next podcast. Mm-hmm. And I know uh, I already got my first. I know Sheena right Hammer will be glad to hear that one, and I know uh, Mr. Hennard here is uh, is glad to hear that one. Oh um, yeah, but uh, one, I'll, 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 be, I'll be interested to hear hear what folks uh, are able to contribute. So, give us feedback. Let us know how things are going and who you'd put on that Mount Rushmore. Absolutely, that that could get interesting. Make sure you like and subscribe too. Just absolutely yeah, like like, like you got to subscribe to our page. Um, you know, like we got to get on. Uh, I was hoping Light would be here to be like, hey, if you subscribe to my YouTube page, make sure you subscribe <laughs> to Holly History. Um, you know, yeah, make sure we really want to grow this. And in order for this to grow, we need to use social media. So this is also a bit of a challenge to, to the listeners. We want you to share this. Share it on Facebook. Share it on Twitter. Share it on everything. Tell family members. Tell everybody you know enjoys history to listen to that uh, to this podcast. We want suggestions. We want feedback. If you have questions, email us about anything. Um, make sure you do that assignment, that homework that Mr. Chrisman gave. He is the department head, the Grand Poobah. So you need to listen to when he speaks. He has spoken. Um, the Poobah has spoken. So, again, if you have questions, hollyhistory65 at gmail.com or tweet us at hollyhistory. Be sure to subscribe and listen to uh, Holly Hub, okay, or, or tweet at that too. Uh, thanks for joining us today, and uh, we hope you listen to uh, the episodes that come out a little bit later. Thank you.